Okay. Great. Um, all right, I'll get started with the first question. Um, so for on your website, the bio says that you use comics to examine intersections of critical disability studies and the environment. Um, mm. Can you discuss some of the ways that these, or the most common ways that these um, tend to overlap? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I guess like right now I'm doing my dissertation on the history of whaling in the U.S. and I'm doing it as a graphic novel, but I'm looking at intersections intersections between whaling and disability um, for the first half for a bit more of like practical of how did like these interactions with whales uh, maim and dismember whalers and cause them to like enter the status of disability. But then the second half really is kind of looking at like where we are now with the environmental movement and also the disability liberation movement and how uh, both of these movements seem to in the 1970s have gotten caught up in this sort of neoliberal uh, individualistic model where like the emphasis isn't on like radical action or sweeping change. It tends to be more on like an affective response to the environment being destroyed or an affective response to requests for disability justice. So like like where like these movements kind of lost momentum uh, in this like period of time in the 1970s where we have this like this potential for liberation and then go into the 80s where there's more of this conservative backlash and again you come out of the system of like oh you can protect the environment by watching a sad movie about whales or something like that like there's no real call to action attached and just like how that has become this sort of kind of anemic thing there's other ways that I think about that too of a uh, one of my pieces that I just got published was all about, uh, I was doing archival research for a different project in Montana a few years ago and being there during the hottest time of the year and thinking about like the impact that climate change has if you're disabled and how like climate change is disproportionately going to impact people who are disabled. Um, so that's a lot of like where my uh, mindset is around, um, around these two fields. But I guess in terms of how comics fit into that, um, one, like I think as a disabled person, I've written a lot about comics as being a very useful form of like a, a useful research tool to think of comics, uh, comics as research because it gives people the right to present things the way that they understand them or the way that they remember them and to sort of recreate the sort of reality or if you want, like, it's a totally plastic universe so you can create your own image of, of, of the way that something happened or the way that you remember something or the way that you might wish something had happened. So I find that to be really useful and engaging. And then just like from a practical standpoint, I've just found that people are always more willing to read something if it's in a graphic novel. So instead of spending uh, four years here working on this book that would like sit on a shelf and that no one would ever read, I'm hopeful that I can turn this into something that's um, useful and that people want to read and, and, and engage with. So that's a very long-winded answer for that, but yes, uh, I, th that's kind of how uh, those three fields show up in my work. Nice. Um, so that kind of goes into my next question, but um, which is how do you represent these topics within your art? And you kind of talked about through like the visual medium and um, yeah. being able to like kind of adjust that to reflect own experiences. But um, what is like a piece of yours that you believe speaks greatly about um, mm -hmm these issues that um you kind of stated yeah i need to think about that i would definitely say bitterroot the piece that i just had with kenyan review um that sticks out of my mind uh the young harris salter which i did with split lip sticks out uh really heavily in my mind um i did tamar mepe which was with uh tampa review another one that i i really felt kind of combined these things and like there's ways in which like I might not overtly make something about the environment, but there'll be something in the background that points to it. Like I, mm -hmm. I, one thing I really like to do when I'm talking about climate change, you're talking about comics where there's like the background is a virulent environment is to add things being on fire. Um, yeah. Really mm -hmm. thinking about like water. Uh, a, a lot of times I really like having like human bodies with animal faces sort of creating these sort of hybrid bodies, I guess in the style of like Donna Haraway or something like that. I also... Um, especially when it comes to disability, I'm very big into like leaning into a plastic universe and kind of trying to create this magical realist um, state of mind where like these, these ideas, and these categories of the body are no longer relevant or germane. And so bodies can do all sorts of things that like you would not think that bodies could do in a, in a, in a regular environment. So like, that's also really important to me to sort of emphasize the plastic nature of comics as a field and like really trying to, um, go out of my way to not draw very many things being totally realistic. Like even in my work right now, 
I'm doing a lot of like kind of gothic magical realism to like tell the story and like things like flying whales and there's a story about like the founding of uh, Nantucket Island where there's this whaler and he's at sea and he gets swallowed by a whale and inside there's a mermaid and the devil playing cards for his soul so like I'm able to bring in like the devil like randomly staying in the background to some of the pictures mm-hmm. or like a mermaid peeping up through the water and so like things like that I think are really uh important to me I'm also like very much interested in the grotesque and um trying to make grotesque things beautiful and beautiful things grotesque and and kind of shifting those ideas and those categories which again I think for me as a disabled person like those are terms that I think we sit with a lot and I think especially considering the history of like the categorizations of disability in the U.S. there's something that I really like to I don't know just kind of screw with and and see how I can challenge them in my work and like maybe not in overt ways like maybe sometimes just in minor ways or like in winks to the audience but that's also really important for me when it comes to my creative work. Mm-hmm. Um, that kind of also what you were stating earlier about like the um, like fire in the background and stuff um, definitely relates to um, something I noticed within your work which is um, that a lot of like the pieces are like kind of like black and white or like mm-hmm muted tones but when you do include color it's um often like reds and oranges and like that kind of um color scheme um so like what draws you to this theme is that more the um like climate change um impact on the environment with like the fire and stuff with like yeah that, that I think that's in my most like distilled form yes I mean because this one being like oil and uh, oil and ice it is talking a lot about like ultimately it's talking about climate change so like there's these weird things like there's like a scarlet macaw in Alaska which again it's a tropical bird it's not supposed to be there but yeah like I I do like using those reds and oranges to kind of allude to fire so in this in overall in the graphic novel the only three colors that I use are uh red orange and blue Mm -hmm. so like there's the blue when I'm doing the oceans but then there's red because red has a lot of different meanings here of like one blood but also it can be used for fire as well um so that's that I've kind of loaded myself on my color <laughs> on my color palette a little bit mm-hmm. uh, more so than I normally would I, I think when I fir- when I first started with comics I was not using color at all like I was very much uh trying to model myself after like Edward Gorey style of just strict black and white but then I came across some Edward Gorey's where he had used color and I really liked them so I guess I like became a color minimalist where like if I have a color that I'm including, I do want it to be kind of deliberate. So mm-hmm. yeah, that's uh, for this for this dissertation all in all, it, it's it's mostly black and white, but on pages where there is color, those are the ones that get used. Okay, yeah, interesting. Yeah, it seems very intentional and like symbolic. So it definitely like comes through with your pieces. Um, yeah. Kind of going off of what you're saying, um, what are some of your inspirations with your work? And um like what are your general inspirations what are you generally inspired by oh yeah in terms of artistic inspirations um Edward Gorey's big influence Remedios Varro is big influence Leonora Carrington uh Carol Walker I think he's doing really cool stuff um Manuel hold on I'm gonna butcher his I'm not gonna remember his name and I want to get it right uh Manuel Lozano, another one, uh, Maria Izquierdo. So like, I, I don't know, like I think I've been on a rabbit side for the past few years into like Mexican surrealists mm-hmm. and kind of trying to lean in on like what what really getting into the work that they're doing. Uh, and uh, artistically, I'm also drawing a lot right now from like French new wave films and thinking about images that come out of French new wave. And like, I, I kind of want my comics to have a kind of jarring effect with like abrupt stops and like mm-hmm. odd camera angles and, repeat camera angles that, that that tell I don't know that are meant to comment something um so those are artistic inspiration in terms of cartoonists um very much uh, Linda Berry who was my mentor at Wisconsin um really love her methods of telling stories and drawing stories and I I, re- I go back to that a lot um I'm gonna I'm gonna look up this last name because mm-hmm. I don't um Uh, Emil Ferris, who wrote My Favorite Thing is Monsters, another really big inspiration. Um, uh, Ebony Flower, who did Hot Comb, um, I think she's doing really great stuff. Isabel Greenberg, who did Encyclopedia of Early Earth. Um, those are, again, people who I'm really inspired by when it comes to comics and comic storytelling. In terms of in life, what I draw a lot of inspiration from, um, I really am just kind of an art history nerd. Like, I think that's what 
excites me. Like I, I, every time I go to a museum, I always come out with like a beehive of like different things I want to draw that have just been inspired by different styles that I've seen or like different color combinations that I've seen. So like right now I'm still kind of writing a high. I went to the Boston Fine Arts Museum for the first time a couple of weeks ago and it's still really like resonating with me. Mm -hmm. um, things like that. I also, uh, when I was in Wyoming, um, I was near Grand Teton. So like I would sometimes go and just sort of sit and draw while I was there, but it was more just like, I liked being outside and the weather was pleasant. I'm not, I'm not really a, a big like draw things from life kind of person, but it can be really nice if I'm in a, a cool place with like a nice climate, it's just like go outside and, and be present in nature and draw. Yeah. Cool. I definitely find that. Yeah. Um, getting inspiration from other like art and, like mm. museums and stuff. Yeah. Um, so on your website, it states that you um, received your MFA or MA in gender studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, could you discuss how these um, studies in that discipline um, represent themselves in your work? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Well, my first ever like long length graphic novel that I did was actually my master's thesis at Madison, which was about disability and gender in the schoolhouse blizzard of 1888 which like impacted these three teachers so like how like categories of gender and disability were constructed in that disaster and I was able to turn that into a comic so again like I hold like in my core that feminist that comics are a feminist research method and that a lot of a lot of feminist researchers bring that into the conversation of like drawing an interview with somebody and showing them what they described to you and then giving them editorial control to say, well, no, it looked more like that or looked more like that. I think mm -hmm. that's all really important uh, in terms of like humanizing research and humanizing uh, experiences that humans have that they're trying to convey through research. So that's always at the corner of my work because that's what I'm trying to do now. It's like a disability studies scholar is really bring in the, that, that category of disability. It's also, um, interesting because I have really had to with this research kind of dig deeper into questions of masculinity and thinking about like masculinity studies and studies of masculinity that I had maybe not paid as much attention to as I should have before um but that's actually been really interesting so like today for example I was reading an article on like masculinity and Jeffersonian democracy and like that's having to show up my work now because like right now if I'm talking about these whale ships like there just wouldn't have been very many women on board because like typically it was viewed as bad luck or women wouldn't be allowed for whatever reason so that's something that I'm having to think about and sit with. Um, but again, it's definitely always in the background of my work. Um, yeah, and again, like a, a lot of the things that I write about, like deal with like researching feminist studies, like the one that the Bitterroot comic that was just published uh, is about like how I was working as a education outreach coordinator for a project about uh, Radcliffe Hall and Una Truebridge. And just like the frustrations that came out of researching these deeply frustrating and problematic women who also were like, literary pioneers in their way and like pioneers for queer rights in a way and, and just having to sit with those nuances and how frustrating that can be I like I have a long-term goal I've not started it yet but uh of uh doing a comic about Betty Friedan being sort of trapped in this bardo where she has to watch uh early 2000s reality tv shows that involve like a man picking a wife from like a pool of like 12 applicants and it all delves into nonsense and chaos but like mm -hmm. so topics like that are still really important to me and and show up in my work a lot because again like I, I be began a cartoonist basically uh, by thinking of it as a feminist research method and a justice-based research methods so that's very important to my work and it's something that I still like kind of hold on to as I uh, continue this process yeah that's interesting I've never really thought about it the way like the justice re research method because like you said earlier, it can definitely like be a representation of how like somebody perceives their world. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's a really cool way of viewing it. Um, I guess I have I have one last question. Um, you kind of touched on this earlier, but um many of your pieces like have this like central character that um is often like human like and then has mm -hmm. um like animal parts, like maybe like an animal face mm -hmm. or um yeah, could you comment on this theme and kind of explain the intentions behind this? Yeah, so I mean, one, I I don't know, I, I like the magical realist element of it. Like I find it surreal and jarring and also like, I don't want to say horror, but I am kind of trying to lean into eco horror a little bit of like, I like these unsettling images I think are important if you're trying to tell a story that is like 
deeply unsettling in regard to unsettling, but that I think a lot of times people just regulate to like, oh, well, that was just part of history. Like they think of whaling as being sad, but also like what's happening right now with climate change and the fact that we're killing more whales now than we did at the heyday of Yankee whaling through like ship collisions. People treat it with this aura of like banality that, that, that it's not something to be distressed about. So, I mean, like part of it is one, I like disrupting the idea of the body as being a single static thing or like trying to draw a person that looks quote unquote, like an ideal person. So like, I do kind of like this mix and match of like a, a human bodies and animal heads and things like that, just to sort of one, like comment on how we think of his bodies and how we think of his like correct and incorrect bodies. Also to like kind of look at these interactions between humans and animals that like, we're not always quite sure what to do with of like these interactions between humans and whales were like usually pretty violent. And it was the same thing with like humans and sharks, but that's because humans are going into these animals habitats and trying to kill them. So like, of course they're going to be violent. So if you don't want to get crushed by a sperm whale, don't go hunt sperm whale. And if like, you don't want to get bitten by a shark, like don't go in shark infested waters to like deliver a bomb, you know, like in world war II. So I think that it's, uh, it, it's, it, it's that kind of sight of these human animal interactions that sometimes can end up being violent that, uh, I'm just really fixated on right now. So mm -hmm. I think that's part of it. And then again, I also like the idea of eco horror uh, as being a genre in and of itself of like these elements of horror existing visually in a place where like slow violence is taking place against humans to get people thinking about that, I think is, is really important to me in my work. I mean, again, and for a very long time, I've always like kind of been fascinated with the interactions between humans and animals. Um, so, I mean, I think that's that's just a very long-winded summary of it. But yeah, that's, that's kind of where my mind is when I'm going in with this human-animal hybrid uh, approach. Because again, I want it to be unsettling and I want people to be disturbed by it. But then I also want to include something in the background that people would find unsettling or disturbing. Like one, the, the man's face is a stingray and behind him there's an oil freighter. So like, think about like what <laughs> what is really terrifying about this concept. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's that's uh, just a very long-winded overview of why I have that as a, a motif that occurs in a lot of my work. Yeah, that just got me thinking actually about how um, a lot of people, or at least like an issue with some people is that um, humans will often have more empathy for like animals that get hurt than like other humans that right. get hurt. So that's like an interesting way of like combining the two that I didn't think of before this so yeah I mean and I, I think one of the things I'm, I, I'm hesitant when I t talk talk about empathy because it's a term that I don't know how valuable I find it is uh, in the in the sense of like the idea that feeling something for someone is perceived of as being enough but like I have done a lot of research into like why do people get more sad mm. when animals die than humans and one I'm like it's got to just be like this weird deflection or like this weird dilute self-delusion technique to help people like emotionally distance themselves from like that, that horror of human suffering. And then also like, I mean, like I, I also think like a lot of my work is drawing on like the histories of colonization and that part of the animal compassion movement had its roots in colonization of like, oh, we're going to the Philippines to ban cockfighting because that's such a horrible practice. And like these people mistreat whales and like we would never. And therefore like, again, like this whole gospel of kindness towards animals is kind of rooted in this idea of like control and and dominance that like I find uncomfortable. And again, like I'm, I'm vegetarian and I've always like really liked animals. And I also until recently like hadn't thought about the number of times that I'd heard people be like, oh, I'm always more sad in a movie when a horse dies mm -hmm. than a human. And I'm like, that is a very peculiar thing to say. Like you can be sad about both. <laughs> like mm -hmm. yeah. and it's just, like personification of human of animals is just being like totally innocent. This personification of all humans is being innately evil that like just like it's it's very strange to watch War Horse and you walk away feeling sad for the horse, you know, like mm -hmm. you just watch like sixteen year old German soldiers get shot for abandonment. Like it's just a very, I don't know. It's and it's not necessarily I don't not something I blame people for, but it is something that I think is imbued within a lot of white dominant culture that people have not fully reckoned with yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very true. Well, um, I'm gonna stop the recording here.